Hello, my name's Andrew Hugel, and I'm going to give you a general introduction to aural diversity. You'll notice that I pronounce the word A-U-R-A-L, aural, rather than oral. This is to avoid confusion with the spoken word. First, a little bit about myself. My interest in this topic comes from my own lived experience. I'm not an audiologist. I'm not a hearing scientist. I'm not an acoustician. Uh, my background is in music. I'm a composer, a musicologist and a creative technologist. I've also written various books on music and computing and areas of French literature and philosophy. I have three invisible disabilities. Firstly, I'm autistic. That was diagnosed in 2018 at the age of 60. Secondly, I have severe unbalanced hearing loss, which includes tinnitus and diplocusis, which people will know as the phenomenon where you hear two different pitches in the two ears. And I also have a balance disorder, which in fact caused the deafness, and that's Meniere's disease. That was diagnosed in 2009. So this project, Aural Diversity, has come very much out of that experience of hearing difference that I've lived with for all my life, really. Aural diversity begins from a very simple observation that everybody hears differently. But we ask the question, whose ear has primacy? All of our acoustics, our design, our technology, our architecture, our music, our society is underpinned by a notion that we all hear the same. There is this idea of otologically normal and that is defined by the British Standards Organisation as the hearing of a healthy 18 to 25 year old. Now 18 to 25 year olds are only 17 percent of the population roughly and in the Aral Diversity Project we argue that this is too small a group to represent the whole of human hearing. John Drever, back in 2018, coined this word, aural diversity, all one word, as a kind of echo of neurodiversity, as a way of distinguishing between normal hearing and atypical hearing. In our project, we are arguing that everybody has atypical hearing to some extent. And really, the project investigates the differences between hearing types, and people and their consequences for individuals, for scientific disciplines, for technology, for audiology, for a range of situations. Now there is a book published about this, Aural Diversity, published a couple of years ago, edited by myself and John Drever, if anybody wants to find out more about it. This infographic I put together with the help of the Aral Diversity Network to try and give an indication of the scope of Aral Diversity. If you look along the bottom of the diagram, in blue, you'll see the progression of normal hearing. Uh, I've put normal in inverted commas, you notice, because uh, we rather reject the idea that there is such a thing as normal hearing. But of course, as we all know, this changes as you go through life. So fetal listening, fetal hearing is different from infant hearing. And infant hearing takes about six months to develop to the point where babies can fully understand uh, and hear uh, a range of sounds. Then we get to the group of teens and young adults whose healthy hearing is defined as normal. After the age of about 25, our hearing starts to change and over the years it deteriorates. And of course, people will be familiar with age-related hearing loss or presbycusis. In presbycusis, typically the high frequencies are lost first and it becomes difficult to distinguish certain speech patterns, certain speech sounds, particularly in crowded situations. And typically, people will be given hearing aids to assist with correcting that hearing loss. And it's quite likely that people will experience some tinnitus as well. 
So that is the typical progression that you'll be very familiar with that affects roughly five-sixths of the world's population. The other one-sixth are characterised by a range of hearing differences. You'll notice that I've avoided the word impairment, loss, disorder and disability. I'm referring instead to differences. I think the reasons for that will become clear as I go on. But of course, audiologists will be very familiar with these, at least the sensory neural and the conductive types. With sensory neural hearing differences, you have everything from profound deafness, genetic congenital deafness, noise induced hearing loss, ototoxic loss caused by drugs, disease, viral, bacterial, fungal infections, and so on. Other causes such as stroke, head trauma, perinatal conditions, hypothyroidism, cancers, and so on. And then auditory neuropathy, where the ear can detect sound but has difficulty passing it to the brain. So these kinds of problems with the inner ear are about 90% of all hearing loss. And then complementing that are the conductive hearing differences. And again, these can be caused by things like viral, bacterial and fungal infections, allergies and so on. Also by conditions of the inner ear, so an enlarged vestibular aqueduct, labyrinthine fistula, superior canal dehiscence and so on. And of course, blockages caused by wax or a temporary blockage, fluid, narrow canal, abnormal bone growth, tumours and so on. And then, of course, there are mixed sensory neural and conductive hearing differences that have a combination of those causes. The area of this diagram that's perhaps more novel and unusual is what I've called auditory system or neurological differences that affect hearing. And here we come to the reason why uh, we prefer the word difference, because, of course, we're not here talking necessarily about hearing loss. In fact, in many instances, we're talking about a heightened form of hearing. Too much hearing, too much sensitivity, created by the way the brain processes sound. The most typical group for this would be neurodivergent people or autistic people who have a heightened sound perception and an ability to focus on detail that is unusual. Hyperacusis has become increasingly common. This is a fairly recent definition, meaning an increased sensitivity to sound, but it's, uh, people are becoming increasingly aware of it. Similarly, uh, misophonia, which is not so much a heightened response to sound, but an emotional reaction to sound. Now, all of these combined include tinnitus or can include tinnitus. And tinnitus is the perception of sound when no sound is present. So you can have sounds like clicking, buzzing, roaring, whooshing, and so on. As I speak to you, I've got tinnitus in both ears, and it varies in loudness and quality throughout the day, and will often be triggered by how tired I am, or whether I've drunk any alcohol, and a whole range of other factors. Tinnitus affects roughly 15% of the world's population and is growing as our noisy environment and listening habits change to include ever longer exposure to loud and intense sounds. And of course, neurodivergences such as autism are increasingly being diagnosed. According to the National Autistic Society, there are currently 700,000 people in the UK who are diagnosed autistic. But I think the real figure is much higher than that. And I think everybody listening to this talk will either know somebody who's autistic or actually be autistic themselves. Given the prevalence of sensory issues in autism, this is not something that can be easily ignored. So all these hearing differences that are medically recognised conditions, and there, there are probably more than are depicted in this diagram, are affecting roughly a sixth of the world's population. So this is a very substantial number of people. Okay, then I think we need to 
move over to the top right of this diagram and consider what I've called universal variations. Now, all of these are backed up by a considerable amount of research, but it's quite clear, for example, that your geographical location, your cultural uh, situation, your economic background and situation, environmental factors, ethnicity, these all affect the way you hear. I have to mention animal hearing. This is not really the focus of this talk, but of course, if we're talking about aural diversity in the animal world, the diversity is vast, much greater than human hearing. And then something that will be of great concern to this conference in particular is, of course, technology. Now, the way hearing aids have traditionally been viewed is that they're trying to correct, as far as that's possible, some kind of deficit in hearing. So amplification, of course, is the first thing. Then uh, a focus on speech, making speech more intelligible. But I, I see hearing aids in a rather different way. And the same is true for cochlear implants and other forms of hearing device. They never function like spectacles. They can't correct hearing directly. Your hearing is your hearing. They can compensate for some hearing loss. But what they do is to create a new way of hearing. I wear hearing aids all the time. I also use other hearing devices. And I hear the world now in a very different way to the way that I heard it before I wore hearing aids. So this is a form of aural diversity. Uh, you can say it's human created or it's technological in nature. AI is increasingly important in this area as a branch of computer audition. And there are other devices like hearables and smart earbuds and assistive listening apps that also change the way that you hear. And more broadly, the field of acoustics engineering in general changes the environment a great deal. And so the way we hear, particularly in the built environment, is affected by uh, the way our acoustics are engineered. Now, I'm very well aware that all this diversity presents a great challenge to audiology. I'm not here to have a go at hard-working audiologists who, in my experience, are very expert and care greatly for their patients. I also have some sympathy with the argument that says we need standards in order to make scientific progress, particularly in a practice-based discipline such as audiology. But as I struggle to make sense of an audiometric test that ignores my tinnitus, that dismisses frequencies below 250 hertz, that's a little below middle C on a piano, that is focused on speech and that shows little or no interest in my autistic listening, let alone my musical listening, I become concerned that progression founded on otological normalcy measures is at best exclusionary and at worst downright ableist. As we introduce AI into the picture, the likelihood is that this will simply amplify those aspects since AI relies on existing knowledge. The social model of disability tells us that it is not the individual but the environment that is disabling. Since all our environment was originally constructed without taking into ac account the needs of disabled people, it's no surprise to find that we have to endlessly make adjust adjustments as a result of advocacy, when in fact the environment should be built from the start to be accessible. The same applies to hearing issues. We need a root and branch re-evaluation of our science with our all diversity in mind, if we are to avoid further entrenched ableism. I recently pleaded with the Institute of Acoustics to rewrite their diploma to include aural diversity in the training. I would make a similar request to this audiology conference. To shift our understanding requires a new curriculum. If this is resonating with you, then please do check out the Aural Diversity Project. The website, the address is given on screen, auraldiversity.org, is a vast archive of materials, paper presentations, music commissions, performances, writings, speculations, 
examples of outreach. We've appeared on the BBC. We've worked with Arup to produce an Aral Diversity Toolkit. Most recently, we've just had £2.2 million in funding to set up a doctoral research centre for Aral Diversity at the Universities of Salford and uh, University of London Goldsmiths College. So thank you very much for listening to this and do get in touch with me. And of course, we have an opportunity now for questions.